I'm in Vancouver today. My colleague Stephen Hoy is here as well. Um, he'll be handling sort of the technical side of things for us. Um, I'm just going to start off with a few logistics notes. Um, if you're engaging on Twitter through this, we're going to be using the hashtag climate election. Um, so feel free to weigh in via Twitter or other social media channels. Um, we're going to start things off with just a few minutes from each of our panelists after I get through this introduction. Um, we'll follow that with about 40 minutes of your questions. Um, I'll moderate those, and if you want to, um, if you have a question, you can type it into the question box in your GoToWebinar panel, uh, and I'll read those out to our panelists. Um, and then finally, just at the end, our executive director, Ed Whittingham, will offer a couple closing remarks at the end of the hour. Um, so just in terms of context, we um, decided to host the webinar a couple weeks ago, and we, like many people, were anticipating a discussion about a, a much different political landscape. Um, I was personally pretty sure would Hillary Clinton would be the first female president-elect, and it, it seemed likely the Democrats uh, would have won control of the Senate, and it also even seemed plausible that, plausible that Washington State could have passed the U.S.'s first carbon tax. Um, so a couple of weeks definitely makes a, a big difference, and we're, we're living in a very different world than what many of us might have imagined a couple of weeks ago. Um, personally, I, I still see a strong economic, environmental, and moral arguments for Canada to continue moving ahead, and that's part of what we'll talk about today. Um, and certainly myself and Appendment were committed to working towards those successes. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that it's, it's not business as usual anymore, and progress is absolutely going to be harder under a President Trump. Um, I personally still have a lot of questions about what the next four years are going to hold in terms of the fight for clean energy. Um, I think as answers start to those as answers to those questions start to emerge, we'll have a better sense of sort of how to best direct our efforts through that. Um, so, with those questions in mind, I'm delighted to introduce our three panelists to share their insights for us today. Uh, so, we have Andrew Revkin, uh, who you'll likely know through his work at the Daughter Earth blog with the New York Times, um, and he's also just announced he's joining the ProPublica team to focus on climate and related issues. Uh, Greg Dotson is the um, Vice President for Energy Policy at the Center for American Progress, a leading policy institute focused on advancing progressive ideas in the United States. And Catherine Harrison is a Professor of Political Science at the University of British Columbia and also the Acting Dean for the Faculty of Arts. She's a leading expert on why governments adopt climate and environmental policies. Um, just before I turn it over to Andrew, I did want to acknowledge um, I think what was often an, an ugly and frightening side of the, the U.S. election. And while we are going to be focused on energy and climate for the next hour, um, it's been some of the messages of hate and intolerance that have really left me with the sort of sickest feeling in my stomach. Um, I did want to share just a, a brief quote from a, a letter that Governor Cuomo of New York put out that I think sort of sums it up well. Um, so while we honor America by honoring the results of the election, we will fight as fiercely as we can at every opportunity that presents itself to reject the hateful attitudes that pervaded throughout the 2016 campaign. We cannot unhear what we have heard. The voices of the Ku Klux Klan, white nationalism, authoritarianism, misogyny, and xenophobia, a generally disdainful view of American ideals. Um, and I would add that the, the same holds true for Canadian values and ideals. Uh, and these, they're not issues that I work on on a day-to-day -day basis, but I think it is important to note that it's, it's hard for me anyways to imagine a clean energy future that I could be happy or excited about if we don't find ways to make progress on those issues as well. So with that, um, I want to turn it over to Andrew and provide some opening remarks. Okay, great. Uh, I assume uh, you can hear me. Um, it's just, you know, it's like my wife uh, woke up this morning um, in this state of emerging despair uh, about those broader issues that you um, articulated very eloquently just now. And, and it's important for those who are, of us who are immersed in this questions of sustainability or climate and energy to keep track of the, that wider context. That, that, you know, it's a shocking thing that got revealed um, in this past year and the country is going to have to do a lot of work um, to figure out how to have conversations going forward that can kind of get past some of that vitriol. And that, that makes the path forward on climate and energy policy harder because uh, everyone is sort of, you know, still in this daze. Um, and the uncertainty right now is is there. There's large uncertainty. Um, they're hidden among the, the. I wrote this piece, I've written three pieces on this since the election. That the one I just put up um, on Dot Earth um, articulates that behind the kind of flashy, inflammatory 
<laughs> unbelievable tweets and sound bites from the campaign trail. There have been these uh, glimmers of, of, of reasonableness and, and rational positions from the Trump campaign. Whether, but the question, of course, right now is: uh, here's a, he's a candidate who, um, like many Republicans in the last six, seven, eight years, has become a masterful ship sh sh shapeshifter. You know, Newt Gingrich, um, John McCain, also once embraced responsible policies related to climate change and then shifted away from that pretty dramatically. And in 2009, as, as Grist uh, broke the story a little while ago and I wrote about um, Trump as a businessman signed onto a letter that was published in the New York Times, a front, full front page, a full page letter, you know, saying that we need international climate change action, not just not just uh, individual or states or the government, but uh, it was basically saying that the Copenhagen to, to Paris process needed to go forward. Um, you know whether there's some shred of that in in Trump uh, at this point is unclear, and these these glimmers of greenness um, hidden largely um, include uh, the statement he made when this organization called Science Debate asked all the candidates for answers to 20 questions, and uh, one was uh, you know he said or his campaign said for him that. Um, that research on renewable energy and moving toward a post-fossil energy future is a responsible thing to do. It had the word perhaps in front of it. When was the last time you heard Donald Trump on the campaign trail use a qualifier like perhaps? But in, in this particular um, statement he did. But it was, and then he, he also talked about um, um, the, um, the need for basic research to drive innovation as well, that science matters, you know, which was a, not something he has said loudly or repeatedly in his campaign, but if there's some glimmer that it might be in there in his policy circles, that's you have to hope for that. And I think the next few weeks, um, as I wrote today, will be kind of the determining moment. Uh, does he choose nuance over, or does he want feel like he needs to um, stick with this kind of cartoonish way of dealing with issues that are complex and important and have longer time scales. And we'll kind of have to see on that. Um, and of course, the other backdrop is, as you mentioned in the opening remarks, that this isn't just about Donald Trump. Congress is now firmly Republican. And that presents an enormous additional set of um, reality wake-up calls for um, environmental agendas. Um, as many analysts and wonks have articulated in tweets and on essays the last few days, there are limits to what can be un, what what he can do or undo. Uh, regulations that are already in place take time to unravel. Um, some things are potentially easy to undermine, or uh, and, um, and this goes way beyond climate and energy policy. And again, there we'll have to see. You know, there the, there are going to be Republicans in Congress who right now are already looking ahead to 2018 when they have to get reelected. And if you look at carefully at the margins in certain states, you know, it was really tight. 27,000 votes in Wisconsin, and there was some horrifying data that ProPublica released actually showing just how um, there were disenfranchised voters, people who couldn't vote because of some of the shifts in the voting protections. Um, that could have made the difference there, you know. Then, but when you have those narrow margins in, in particular places, um, this idea that this is a new groundswell, that it, there's a mandate here, when you look carefully, um, kind of goes away. So uh, it's not like it's free reign party time for um, Republican edge, you know, the hardcore conservative edge of the party. Um, but you know, this is really kind of a a waiting period. Maybe a, a, you know, hopefully some smart people are reaching out to the campaign, I mean not to the campaign, but to the transition team, and uh, trying to articulate pathways forward that might not be increasingly inflammatory, increasingly div divisive, and um, in the long run counterproductive for energy and climate policy. I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I will turn it over to to Greg to go next. And just a reminder, if you if you do have questions, you'll see a, a questions tab in your webinar, go to webinar panel. You can type those in and I'll I'll keep a track of them to, to ask once we move through the opening remarks. So Greg, over to you. Great. Thanks for um, thanks for letting me join you today. So back in June, the Center for American Progress, along with the Pemina Institute and four other think tanks, 
from Canada, the United States, and Mexico put out a proposal for a North American climate strategy. And we noted that for the first time in recent memory, the national governments of, of, of the North American countries were all politically aligned on climate change. And it was presented a real opportunity to explore and launch coordinated climate initiatives. Um, you know, what a difference a week makes, I guess you'd say. Uh, due to the Electoral College, you know, despite losing the popular vote by around 800,000 votes um, as of yesterday, Donald Trump will be the next president. And he comes into office having espoused a really divisive rhetoric, as you mentioned, Matt, and, and that drew support from some of the United States, but it drew revulsion from many more. On election day, his disapproval rating was around 60%. His approval rating was below 40%. To put this in perspective, um, George W. Bush's approval rating did not consistently slide below 40% until 2006. That's after the torture at Abu Ghraib was discovered, the mismanagement of the recovery of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, the failure to find weapons of mass destruction that formed the basis for the war in Iraq and a, a failed public campaign to privatize our popular social security program. In short, um, Trump is the most unpopular person ever elected to the president of the United States, as president of the United States. And you know, this is going to be really important context for the policy changes that his administration will now push. Climate change was not something that was heavily focused upon during the election. Uh, they uh, you know, I, I believe to the extent it was raised in the debates, it was raised by Secretary Clinton. The Trump campaign down, downplayed the potential for any serious impacts related to climate change. Um, and the GOP platform said that uh, essentially the government should be forbidden from regulating carbon pollution, uh, rejected global eff efforts to tackle climate change. Trump personally said he wanted to scrap environmental regulations, including the Clean Power Plan, and to cancel the Paris Climate Agreement. Post-election, we've seen a lot of backpedaling on a number of issues that he ran on and, and talked about even more than climate change. For example, Obamacare, uh, I think the closing argument was, we need to repeal it now. And, and that's not what we're hearing from the campaign now. We're now hearing that, well, maybe we'll just have to leave that in, in place. And I think that's one of the most high-profile examples, but we're also seeing Senator McConnell in the Senate, who will be the Senate Majority Leader again, saying that um, repealing the, the so-called war on coal is not going to bring back any coal jobs, which was another central part of the, of the Trump campaign. And there's also news reports that say the Paris Climate Agreement is also going to be spared, that they're going to leave that in, in place as well. But I don't, think, I don't think we know that definitively yet, and I think I, I agree with Andrew that we're kind of in this period now of waiting to see what is real and what is not real. Um, but certainly his, his staff choice for the transition team demonstrates that he is giving power and voice to the most vocal opponents of action on climate change. Myron Ebel, uh, he is a well-known climate denier in Washington, D.C. He's featured in Politico today. Uh, they label him Trump's attack dog. And uh, he is leading the, the transition uh, for the Environmental Protection Agency. And I think that makes it makes it very clear that um, there are going to be U.S. policies that are going to be in jeopardy. As I think probably most people tuning in are aware, uh, the Clean Power Plan um, is a requirement that, the, that regulates carbon dioxide emissions from the United States fossil power plants. It's estimated that essentially uh, by 2030 it would reduce emissions by about 35 percent below 2005 levels from that sector, which which is significant, and it would boost renewable energy and and um, and, uh, and other and other low carbon forms of, of energy electricity production. Um, and I think that's that's an area where we could certainly see uh, we could certainly see an attack. And Paris may also be in jeopardy, despite my previous comment. But I think ultimately the transition to a clean energy economy is unstoppable, no matter what the administration does. And I'll, I'll tell you briefly why. We can get into important questions. And it's essentially the economics, public opinion, and um, the pressure of international affairs. You know, the, the Clean Power Plan uh, does 
according to modeling, achieve significant pollution reductions. But any analyst who's looked at it closely will tell you that it does not maximize the pollution that is cost effective to reduce. And that's because it, it does a number of things. The baseline it uses, it uses, um, it uses estimates of the cost of renewable energy that is not current. So it, it assumes that solar and wind electricity generation is more expensive than it actually is. And um, what, what that has the potential to do is uh, the Clean Power Plan, the Clean Power Plan gives our electric utilities a sense of certainty about where they're headed in 2030. If it were to be unwound, what that does is introduce new uncertainty, and those utility executives will understand that greater reductions are, in fact, achievable and cost effective. And with the injection of that uncertainty, I believe the safe bet, the safe investment, goes back to low carbon. And I think you might even actually do it even more than if you, if you knew you had an attainable goal for 2030. Um, as far as public opinion goes, you know, I think the New York Times noted during this last you know, catastrophic Baton Rouge flood that it was the eighth once in 500 year event to occur since May of 2015. People are understanding that there is climate change is having an impact, is an effect, it is, it is, it is causing consequences in the United States today. We're at an eight year high on public concern. And in the critical swing states of Colorado, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, at least 75% of surveyed adults say that uh, support regulating carbon dioxide as a pollutant. And over 60% of them say that uh, global warming is gonna harm future generations if not acted upon. And I think that uh, a government that, re that rejects those public opinion, um, it's one thing in a campaign that doesn't focus on it at all. It's another thing when you have a government in power taking action and the press is really drawing attention to it, and as, as would be our environmental community. And then finally, uh, just look at the international response since the, um, since the United States election. There has been no country that has said if the United States pulls out of Paris, they will pull out as well. In fact, there have been additional countries that have ratified the Paris Agreement since the election including Australia, Finland, some African nations, uh, I think Pakistan as well. And um, we've had China, we've had uh, various European countries also talk about the need to, to stay with Paris. So I, my, I, I believe that um, ultimately these forces are going to be more compelling than ideology. And, uh, and for that reason, no matter the fate of any one individual regulation, the move towards clean power in the United States will continue. And I'll leave it there and answer any questions. Thank you very much, Craig. And uh, for our last opening remarks, over to you, Catherine. Sack, will I share my webcam? Hello, everyone. Am I visible? You just disappeared, Catherine. Get back. Okay. Um, I imagine um, all of us have had our inboxes flooded with different analyses that are, you know, presenting competing competing um, predictions on just how bad it'll be. And some argue it's not going to be that bad. Uh, you know, progress may be stalled for a few years. Others are predicting Armageddon. But I think. What there's agreement on is that it's not good that American voters have elected to the White House um, a denier in chief, someone who has publicly said that they think climate change is a hoax, and also handed majorities in both chambers of Congress to a party, the leadership of which have all rejected scientific consensus on climate change. So the details remain to be seen, but the picture is pretty um, disconcerting, particularly at a time internationally when um, the countries of the world are still proceeding on a new path with the Paris Agreement just having come into force. So whether the U.S. formally withdraws or just takes a step back from the Paris Agreement, it still has the potential to send a chilling message, I think, to other countries, both with, with respect to climate finance and with respect to um, the level of resolve they will have in, in fulfilling their own obligations to cut greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that that chilling effect is particularly great for Canada. If there's going to be dominoes that fall, the first domino 
will be Canada because we rely on the U.S. for about three quarters of our exports and um, about two thirds of our imports come from the U.S. So the, the integration of the two economies makes this particularly important for Canada. Um, a bit of context, uh, this feels unprecedented at the moment, but in terms of Canadian climate policy, we've been in a very similar situation 15 years ago when um, the international community was negotiating the final details of the, the Kyoto Protocol amidst uncertainty of who would be um, the next U.S. president. And once it was determined that that was George W. Bush, one of his first actions after the inauguration was to announce that the U.S. would withdraw from the Cato Protocol. Now that was uh, a very loud announcement in Canada because for the last 25 years Canadian governments have hitched their wagon in international negotiations on climate change to the US. We've always set our targets based on the US targets. We did that in Kyoto and we've done it again um, in Paris. So 15 years ago that US announcement created a very strong political backlash from the business community who threatened there would be 450,000 jobs lost from the parliamentary opposition including um, divisions within the majority liberal governments caucus and from provincial governments who were strongly opposed to a uni unilateral federal plan. Now, a year later, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, Prime Minister Chrétien announced that Canada would in fact ratify the Kyoto Protocol and would forge ahead and, and that was seen as a bold statement for um, Canadian independence and our commitment to multilateralism on the international stage. But then, as those of us who follow Canadian policy know, we didn't do anything. The Chrétien government didn't follow through, the Martin government didn't follow through, the, the Harper government didn't follow through, although there was a brief moment when it looked like the U.S. would adopt a cap-and-trade program, that Canada would as well. So we have a long history of not following through on our progress, um, on our promises, particularly when there has been a risk of divergence from the U.S. Um, so a few specific, uh, a few specific items um, that I think are, are relevant going forward. Um, the first is that the election of Donald Trump um, increases the political challenge of the Trudeau government following through on its commitment to establish a carbon price that would reach $50 per ton by 2022. So I think as in two, um, 2001 we will see and we've already started to see growing pushback from the business community. Um, the interim conservative leader, Rana Ambrose, has said that proceeding now would be insanity. It will further empower provincial opposition and I think destabilizes um, the political support for carbon pricing, if not the federal plan, from the Alberta government. Um, so we'll see what happens going forward. The federal provincial meeting uh, and the promise of announcement of a national plan on climate change involving the provinces and federal government by the end of the year will be really telling. We'll see where that goes. I think it increases the benefits of revenue neutral approaches to carbon pricing and also in considering potential competitiveness impacts on uh, trade exposed sectors to really have solid analysis and careful policy design because not everyone who says that they're competitively disadvantaged actually is and it's not necessarily the case that the solution is to waive the carbon price. There's other ways to deal with that. Um, a second issue, Keystone XL, back on the agenda. That is a much easier political um, pipeline than either Trans Mountain Expansion or Energy East for the Trudeau government. But it's still a challenging issue because they, um, well first I think there will still be extremely strong um, public opposition within the U.S. to Keystone XL, even if it's approved by um, President-elect Trump. And because the Trudeau government has to make a decision in the next month or so on the Trans Mountain expansion proposal before they know what's going to happen with Keystone XL. So my guess is we may see Key Keystone XL approved, but I think we'll probably still see approval of the Kinder Morgan pipeline um, in the weeks to come. And finally, and this one is is hardest to gauge but potentially most important, I think, um, the election of Donald Trump and the potential for at least a stall if not a reversal of U.S. actions has the potential to destabilize some very fragile political bargains um, that undermine 
the national climate change proposals in Canada. The first is within the Liberal Party, where Prime Minister Trudeau has said, on one hand, we'll take action, we'll price carbon, and on the other hand, we'll get our resources to market. We'll build at least one pipeline. Um, the, the second is this more elaborate deal. I have no idea whether it was a formal agreement or whether the pieces just happened to fit between the federal government, British Columbia, and Alberta. The federal government got carbon pricing. The BC government got approval of the um, Pacific Northwest LNG plant. And Alberta uh, is expecting, I assume, to get a pipeline, at least one pipeline. Um, the, the premise underlying both of those deals has been that Canada needed to clean up its act to restore the rep reputation of our fossil fuel sector and ensure stability of exports. Now, almost all of our exports now go to the U.S. and it's not clear that the U.S. cares anymore um, about the reputation of our industry, at least the U.S. government at the federal level. So my concern is that we've built a house of cards. We pretended that expanding fossil fuel exports is consistent with deep reductions in greenhouse gas emissions other than through heavy reliance on international credits which the federal government isn't talking about and my concern is that one of those cards has just been removed so I think there's a lot to watch going forward and the fact that Prime Minister Trudeau has said he'll stay the course is is a good start but it remains to be seen through action and uh, continued progress in Canada Thank you very much, um, Catherine. That gives us off to a great start. And I've got lots of questions here. Um, so I think we're all coming back uh, video-wise. Um, so I can, the first one here, there's a couple here sort of around Paris and sort of the um, international context. And like the first one, maybe I'll put to you first, Greg, is sort of more of a technical question in nature. Is just sort of what would the process be for the U.S. withdrawing uh, from the Paris Agreement and sort of um, timeline around that if they if they do decide to go down that path? Well, I think um, my understanding is that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process that would take at least three years um, to withdraw from Paris. However, you know, a presidential statement that we're going to withdraw from Paris, I think, is, is very damaging and, and perhaps, you know, equivalent to, to pulling out. So um, I think the actual mechanics of it, in some ways, is less important than the, just the stated intent. You know, it's sort of like the Brexit vote. You know, they didn't have to actually withdraw for the damage to be done. There, there is, um, I've heard, and I haven't yet been able to kind of fact check it, that Trump could do a, kind of a quick kill, in essence, by uh, putting the, um, the Paris Agreement to the Senate for ratification vote. And, the, and of course they would reject it, which uh, they did it with um, Kyoto. They they did sort of a, they did a kind of advanced killing of Kyoto with a vote in the Senate. Um, and I my sense is that could happen way like basically in February or March. Um, it, but the, it, so it says we're not you know we're not going to abide by it. Is uh, now it's not a treaty in in legal sense. Uh, that was a very careful part of the negotiations in Paris. Um, because countries like the United States would have to go, it has to be a two-thirds majority in the Senate uh, to um, give consent, uh, advice and consent on a treaty. It's a very high bar. So no one, uh, they, they knew going in that the United States would not treat this as a treaty process, but, but something I just read was in the last 12 hours um, implied that that's a, that's a strategy he could um, take really quickly if he wants to. And then there's the money, the flow of the U.S. money to help support the UN programs, which is also a vulnerability that could be um, exploited um, almost immediately. I, w I would assume that money is not as we've seen the last of that money transferred for a little while. Yeah, I was just looking at something. It's a couple billion dollars a, a year, so I'm not sure what the total what that is in percentage of the total. So you know, stuff can happen. They're all there's a lot of cleverness in Washington. Well, you know. <laughs> More than okay. I. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the one thing we've seen, um, we've seen some misstatements from the Trump campaign where they said essentially they're going to cancel payments to the UN and invest $100 billion in U.S. infrastructure. Well, the United States doesn't give $100 billion to the UN. No. There is a, we've made a pledge of $3 billion to the Green Climate Fund, of which I think about $500 million has been made. 
And so the vast majority of the money that they're talking about over, over an eight, eight or ten year period is money that's invested in the United States through our clean energy programs, research, and other uh, national laboratories, universities. And I think that each of those, each withdrawing money from each of those points um, you know, has a lot of political peril. Um, I've got a, a couple of questions here sort of along the theme of sort of checks and balances um, to Trump, and I think a number of these are in response to some of your remarks, Greg. Um, but I, uh, why don't we, I'll start sort of at the international level and um, just, I guess the questions here are trying to group them together, but in general sort of um, what are you seeing as the ability of other nations to sort of put pressure on the U.S. Um, depending on the direction that Trump wants to go, and a few specifically around China and sort of thoughts on if, if they are in a position to take on a leadership role if the U.S. is not? Maybe we can start with you, Catherine. I'm skeptical. Um, I, you know, what I'm more interested in seeing is whether all the other countries announce that they're going to forge ahead anyway without the U.S., but, um, yeah, uh, I mean, if it was easy to move the U.S. internationally, we would have seen it during that long period when the U.S. was an outlier on the Kyoto Protocol, so I, I guess I'm skeptical of that. Uh, Please convince me otherwise, Greg and Andrew. <laughs> well, just briefly, I, I, I talked to David Sandalow this morning, who was a, um, a climate negotiator, sort of one of the climate officials at the State Department until recently under um, Obama and is now at Columbia University. He's in Marrakesh right now and he sent this note that I just added to Dot Earth this morning uh, basically saying that um, this is about China and he's working in specifically with China. He said the Paris Agreement is designed to be resilient to the withdrawal of even a major emitter. Many countries would be determined not to let that prevent the rest of the world from fighting climate change. There would be some attrition, but it could end up strengthening resolve on the part of some countries. Withdrawing from, from the Paris Agreement would hurt U.S. interests and reputation around the world. It would provide China with a strategic opportunity at elevating Chinese credibility at the expense of the U.S. Now that's the point that hopefully someone is making within Trump's uh, national security um, uh, group. Um, Jim Woolsey, former CIA director, was a Trump campaign advisor who also drives a Prius and is a solar energy hawk and you know if he's staying in the loop um, maybe someone like him will say you know the, we'll be able to articulate it's pretty nuanced I don't know for uh, Mr. Trump whether this is too nuanced but that just um, letting go of climate policy and the leadership role there has ramifications that are strategic um, in every you know in developing countries and in the Pacific Rim and that kind of thing well I guess again we'll see and I think a, a point that I would make is just that you know, we already have uh, two Canadian provinces that are have decided to integrate their climate policies with the state of California. Mexico is interested in selling offsets into that market as well. In fact, you know, in the United States, 25% of the population and 30% of our economic activity already happens in a place that has a price on carbon. So. Um, I think that it's a little bit more entrenched than maybe appreciated, and um, and uh, you know, and my, you know, my hope is that it, that an expectation is going to continue. Okay, that sort of blends well into the sort of the next layer of this question on sort of checks and balances, and um, some interest here in sort of what role U.S. states and sort of U.S. local governments have to play over the next four years, and. A um, couple sort of examples here being California and their climate plan in New York and some of the things they've done. So uh, interested in your thoughts on sort of what role or what that dynamic looks like going forward. Uh, I'm, Greg, I'm, Greg, you yeah, I'm happy to jump in on that. I mean, I think, you know, the, the fundamental change that has happened um, since the passage of the Recovery Act is that renewable energy is the cheap form of electricity in the United States. And that's not absolutely true in every single location for every single use, but it is broadly true in many parts of the country. And the, um, the, the challenge has been how do you take a regulatory system that, that, you know, that existed for, in many cases, 100 years and didn't, you know, wasn't designed for this kind of disruptive technology and how do they deal with this? But it doesn't change the ultimate cost equation. And so I think as we see states like California and New York, you know, um, 
move towards 40% renewable energy, move towards a 40% a cut in greenhouse gases. You know, all that's going to do is continue to bring those costs costs down, and and to me, that's going to become irresistible to to for for the utilities as they determine the business model that works that will spread around the country, and uh, and and we, and we will continue to see its proliferation in the U.S. If I could jump in here, um, I think there has been a lot of enthusiasm about the, the fact that state governments and provincial governments and local governments have been doing anything that they've been forging ahead often with um, vacuums at the federal level in both Canada and the US in the last couple of decades and I think that's great and you know yay California, yay Quebec and Ontario but I have been a bit of a skeptic about how far that can take us because we have tended to see the provinces and states that are showing leadership being the ones that already have the cleanest economy, that have the least to lose, mm -hmm. um, and the provinces and states that are following them uh, are not the dirty ones. Now in Canada we do now have the province of Alberta with a commitment to carbon pricing, but it's a particular carbon pricing plan which is predicated on a 50% or more expansion of emissions from the oil industry. So. That's, you know, as carbon pricing plans go, that is one designed to protect fossil fuels for at least a couple of decades to come. So my concern is that, and I, I very much hope that those province and states continue to forge ahead with whether it's carbon taxes or cap and trade, um, but I don't think that that's going to compensate for uh, any failures that proceed at the national level in either country. It's a multi-decadal, it's a multi-multi-decadal issue, and I think the key thing is that even as we do, you know, face setbacks in the international government, the way they approach this, I think that's very, you know, almost unavoidable. I think continued um, advancement at the state level is is critical. And that's all I, the I agree with that. I'm just I'm just scared to death about how much we can afford um, those those setbacks right now when we're nowhere near on path to, to see uh, the international target. Yeah. It's a, one, one thing that, you know, Trump, one of the, the most cartoonish things he's been saying is uh, that we're going to unleash um, American extractive energy again in a world where markets are already the thing that, that's driving the reductions and, you know, a low, low oil price is the thing that's threatened uh, Alberta's tar sands more than any policy, I assume everyone would say that's correct. So it's, um, these are not necessarily things that are in his, he can't just say, hey, turn on the taps and have everyone start drilling and, and digging again for coal or oil. So, so some of that is um, baked in, uh, not just because of climate action, but because of the way uh, global markets are working on some of these things. In fact, the the fact that the U.S. has already turned on the taps and dramatically expanded U.S. oil production has contributed to that decline in the price yeah. of oil and the loss of competitiveness of Canadian bitumen. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> um, Those issues put a, put a target right on uh, the vehicle emission standards in the U.S. because if we continue on a downward trajectory on, on um, the, the amount of oil that we need to power our transportation sector, that only continues the same dynamics that have, have uh, resulted in a glut in oil and de declining prices. But oil prices will go up again, for sure. Um, you know, it's like clockwork. You look at trends historically, the world is heading toward 9 billion people. And, and um, in India, I wrote this a few years ago, you look at India's sort of per capita oil use, it's, it's a tiny, 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 tiny fraction, order of magnitude below the United States at least. Um, and so as that tweaks up, presuming they figure out how to build roads, and uh, which has not been pretty, you know, unclog their roads, um, the demands will be there. And the security issues in the Middle East might cause bumps that'll suddenly um, create that those pressures again. It's, um, Demand rules that mar that that arena. It still seems, and there is a lot of upside potential there still. For, yeah, for uh, oil more than coal. For oil more than coal. Shift gears with the questions here a little bit, and I apologize to the audience. We've we've got a ton of questions, so I'm definitely not going to be able to get to all of them. 
Um, this one sort of, um, I'll start with um, you again, Catherine, because it relates to some of your comments about sort of, well, so the question here is essentially is where should Canada go in light of this um, development? And um, I know um, any, any expertise or advice, Greg or Andrew, you can offer as well would be appreciated, but there's a number of questions here around the implications for Canada and Canadian climate policy and what the, the federal government should be doing in particular. I think we should stay the course and actually do it this time, follow through on, on our promises. Um, I think that in environmental policy forever and in climate policy in particular, the, the competitiveness impacts are always exaggerated. Uh, it's very hard to find that, that factory that ever went out of business because of environmental regulation. So I think we need to inject lots of information into this debate. We need to say um, which sectors really are um, emissions intensive and trade exposed and are there ways to design policies that will move Canada towards a cleaner energy economy at the same time, shielding those sectors from some of the some of the worst competitiveness impacts if the U.S. doesn't move forward. Um, on the mobile sources side, I think it's going to be a challenge if the U.S. stalls in continuing to tighten regulation for light duty and heavy duty vehicles because our um, motor vehicle industries are so closely integrated and Canada has been a policy taker for decades on that file, but there's always the potential that California will strike on strike out on its own under the, the Clean Air Act, and that's one where I think other states may follow suit and Canada would have an opportunity to do that as well. Um, so, I mean, I think the political challenge got harder, but maybe this is the moment of um, for some candor and for some honesty on what challenges lie before us, what can be done, which sectors are actually vulnerable and which ones aren't. Canadians aren't going to go build their houses in, in Wyoming um, because it gets uh, because we have building codes that, that require cleaner heating of homes or something like that. So not everything in the Canadian economy is vulnerable. Uh, and I you know I think that that is part of um, the conversation going forward. Anything to add, Greg or Andrew? I bring on more questions. Okay. Um, maybe just I'll, I'll group some of these together, but I'll, I'll jump to the state level. There's a few questions here around the Washington State Carbon Tax Ballot Initiative, and um, uh, I'm not sure who sort of the degree to which you were following that, but just interest in how that debate unfolded, where you seem to have um, environmentalists sort of debating amongst environmentalists on the, the policy proposal. Um, so there's a few questions along those sort of lines. If, uh, maybe we can start with Greg or Andrew if you're able to add anything to that. Sure, I can, uh, I can start off. I mean, I think um, you know, there's a number of, there's, there's probably going to be more detailed post-mortems on that than I will give right now. But I would say that, um, that two things that I would flag is, one, you know, the, the, the whole structure of it was designed to bring bring uh, conservative voters to the table, and that never worked. And I think that really calls into question kind of the fundamental, um, you know, strategy of what of how you how you bring um, how and if you bring uh, voters who are not traditional climate change voters uh, to the table on these issues. And then the second thing is I think there's a fundamental misstep, um, which was you know rather than Sort of engaging, uh, you know, friends in the state government. They apparently set off and wrote this, wrote this, without talking to people who knew how the bill would actually be scored. And so the fundamental effect of the bill was that it cut the state's budget. And whenever you're cutting a state budget, you're activating every group that has any interest in that state budget to oppose you. And that everything from schools to, you know, transportation to, you know, you name it. So I think those, you combine those two things, and that's just not a winning formula. Yeah, and on the other side, at least from what I saw, and I didn't track it closely, but I was tracking people like David Roberts, who writes for Vox and lives in, in Seattle, um, uh, was that the left played a role, partially I think it was some of what you were just talking about, Greg, in terms of how the bill was, the architecture evolved. But um, there's this demand for perfection on certain things from the left that I think, um, and again, we, we could have an endless discussion of 
whether it's feasible to, to woo Republicans ever in, or conservatives into um, smart energy policy discussions. But but the, the, the actions in the United States got so strange ahead of the election, for example, on the Dakota pipeline, um, there was this effort by some friends of mine, including friends of mine like Bill McKibben, to force Hillary to come out with a you know strong statement in support of the no DAPL, you know the no Dakota pipeline protests. Um, literally in the days ahead of an election where the middle absolutely mattered to outcomes in many states, and you know to force her to do a litmus test on yeah, an issue that has all kinds of ramifications and that does need attention, but timing matters to me. I wrote a piece at the time, just kind of saying you know hello, is this the best time to make your your sort of um, no oil moving through the Dakotas demand on a, on a candidate who built her candidacy around a wide, uh, you know, moderate approach. Um, is that what you really want? And, I, you know, clearly many things contributed to the these losses in these many states. The, the change movement uh, just trumped everything, so to speak. But, but um, you have to wonder whether some of that absolutism in the, you know, um, ends up being useful, if, or at least if, if it's not wielded with care. The one thing I'd add is that um, I think there are ways to craft carbon taxes to build public support or public acceptance of them, but it's a really tall order to ask voters to vote for a carbon tax in any jurisdiction. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see in a Canadian context how that unfolds with conservative voters. One of the one of the candidates, Michael Chong, does have a, a carbon price at the center of his proposal, and we'll be interested to see how that unfolds over the next year. Um, we're going to try one piece of technology here with a poll that Stephen will hopefully get up. Um, we'll see if that works. And the next question, just so people can think about it, is going to be more directly in sort of the pipeline space, um, both around Keystone XL and Kinder Morgan. Okay, so you should see that. This is sort of similar to a similar question. We had an actually similar to an abacus uh, poll that was released today. Um, if Trump shifts U.S. climate policy, what should Canada do? So just interested in getting a sense of where um, our audience today is at. So the, the two options, just to simplify it, um, continue to make the changes that will reduce our emissions, um, or I think as Catherine put it, start to make the changes that will reduce our emissions. Um, and then the second option would be to slow the pace of our actions to align with the U.S. So if you want to click that off and we'll give you 20 seconds or so just to, to fill it out and see where the results are. So, we'll see what we have. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, it's interesting. I, so, it's, that's, I think, typical for the skew and a, a PEMAN audience for these sort of things. But the, the abacus polling, which was a, a public piece today, I think had about 70% um, supportive of continued action in the country versus slowing down. So, um, there is definitely uh, at a public polling level, support for the idea of continuing to move ahead in Canada. Um, so just on to the, the next question here, and we've um, probably got time for a couple more questions. Um, regarding pipelines, and oil pipelines in particular, so Trump has promised to um, uh, sort of resuscitate and approve the Keystone XL pipeline. And I guess maybe sort of a two-part question for um, Greg and Andrew, just interested in your thoughts on the prospects of that and what the, the opposition might look like to it in the U.S. And um, Catherine, if you can comment on what it might mean for pipeline proposals in Canada. I, I actually, I, <laughs> I was tweeting about what we're doing and I missed the, the first part of that question. I'm sorry. Maybe Catherine oh. can go first. I can repeat it anyway, just so you have it. So just um, more generally on oil pipelines, but with the, the um, yeah. President-elect Trump promising to um, resuscitate and approve the Keystone XL pipeline. It's your perspectives on the prospects of doing that and um, especially given how much of the climate movement in the U.S. was built around opposition to Keystone in the first place, what ability that opposition has to sort of refocus on the pipeline. 
Oh, the the opposition will refocus, but he'll do it. It's and then it's just a matter of markets again whether it'll make economic sense. If oil prices stay low, if oil prices rise, it'll proceed, and it's going to happen. Uh, if under Trump presidency and Republican Congress, um, it does give an opening for uh, the green, you know, the left to get out there and. You know, it was more of a question in 2010, 2011, whether they should have hung it around um, Obama's neck as a as an issue, a key point in his in his career. Um, but you know, with the Trump in office, it's an absolutely a galvanizing um, issue for the environmental left to make all of these pipeline, you know, plans and and um, investments uh, something to focus on. Right now, today, I believe there's a big action on the banks. That are doing the financing for for um, the Dakota pipeline. I'm not quite sure if that's spilled over into the Keystone, but it's you know what what's happened typically uh, when you have an anti-environmental um, administration, it really does empower the the uh, hard left, the sort of far left, the you know the aggressive left, the uh, to get busy and get out there and do um, be active. One question in my mind is how long, um, you know, assuming it's approved, Keystone XL by uh, President-elect Trump, what is the potential for delay of actually building and getting that pipeline into operation um, as a result of protests? Because there have already been hundreds, I think by now thousands of people arrested at the White House. We're seeing the beginnings of a uh, rural opposition at the site of pipeline construction. And so I'm curious how much un uncertainty that throws into the business case, even if the political approval is now um, a virtual certainty, and what that means for Canada, because if Keystone XL um, is a, a no-brainer, as a former Canadian Prime Minister has said, it's, it takes the pressure off for approval of either Energy East or Trans Mountain expansion, but um, Prime Minister Trudeau has to make a decision on Trans Mountain before he'll know about Keystone XL. And what I find myself wondering is, is there's a way for the federal government to approve it with an asterisk? like approve Trans Mountain but have to revisit the business case for the pipeline in X years or, or something like that. I have no idea what the, the legal context of that would be, but I bet there's a bunch of people in the PMO um, investigating that about now because it's a, the timing is very uh, difficult for the Prime Minister. Well, I'm sure Greg has some thoughts on the dynamics, the political dynamics around the pipelines here. but. Uh, uh, you know what I just said about the left being empowered. Unfortunately, if if the more aggressive actions are taken uh, to sort of block these pipelines, and that kind of feeds into the politics of the right as well, and Trump can being, being the law and order guy will say, "Oh, we got to stamp this out and bring in the national guard." And I mean, who knows? It could lead to some pretty ugly um, outcomes. Yeah, I think I don't know that it's fully appreciated that you know in the United States, the authority to site oil pipelines is a state responsibility. So the only reason the federal government was involved in Keystone XL was because it crossed an international border. And um, although the common narrative is that it was really President Obama that was delaying, I mean, obviously they did delay approval and ultimately denied approval, but um, throughout that time they were never able to secure all the state permits to build a pipeline. And uh, for those groups that now have a lot of expertise and capacity and in fighting, fighting those pipelines, and these are folks who are ranchers and farmers and not your traditional environmental activists in the, in the upper Great Plains, um, they were looking at additional years of litigation on Keystone XL, even if it got its presidential permit. So I think that is kind of an important you know, part of this conversation, which is um, Keystone XL became a way for people to learn how to fight these pipelines, and now they know how, and I think it's, that's going to continue. Now that could play into the infrastructure debate that, that Trump has talked about because, you know, um, he, I don't know that he's really, I would say he's not a policy wonk, but I would say that the, uh, that members in con of Congress could see an infrastructure bill as a way of removing these state and local obstacles for energy projects that they favor. The one thing I would add to the, the previous discussion we had about um, state and provincial leadership is that there's a second dynamic in addition to the leadership and that's obstruction. Um, so we've 
that you know even if there are provinces that are not going to lead in carbon pricing or regulatory initiatives what we may see is that they can play an increasing um, increasingly influential role by obstructing infrastructure projects that would cross their territory um, particularly pipelines I'm going to try to squeeze in one last question here so maybe just some quick thoughts on it but we we've, we've probably focus sort of more on the the left side of this debate and interested in your thoughts on sort of where American Republican voters may sort of lie on this issue sort of looking at over the next few years and whether they are potentially supportive of these shifts we've been talking about or are they also a potential check and balance on where Trump could go? So much of this depends on the um, first months of the Trump administration because uh, if, if he um, further alienates that half of America that as um, was said earlier by Greg, he's got these lo really low you know, approval rating overall. Um, if that gets worse, then th those candidates already will be out there getting ready to get reelected in 2018, and the House are going to be freaking out unless there's some move to the center. So it's all kind of like it's up to Trump and his minions right now to determine, I think, the tenor and the trajectory for Republicans for the next couple of years, and remember, just just like two, three weeks ago, the press was all writing about the death of the Republican Party. <laughs> My God, you know, part of us, part of this is we have to just stop pontificating and thinking and just watch because it's just like it, the any idea that 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 I or anyone else has the wisdom to kind of predict how this is going to play out is probably a little fantastical. One one thing I would say is that um. You know, the conventional wisdom, you, Matt, you described it accurately at the beginning of the conversation about what the election might bring. And everyone in Washington, D.C. expected that, that after, a, um, after, we re -elected a, after we elected a president that wanted to act on climate and the Senate that was interested in doing that, everyone would be happy for about two hours. And then they would say, oh, the 2018 elections, what are we going to do? And um, because it's a difficult map for the Democratic Party um, and therefore the people who, who care about climate change the most in the United States, um, Trump has the potential to completely scramble that dynamic. And I think this is, I'm just saying what, probably putting a slightly finer point on what Andrew was just saying. And so I think it is very hard to know because you could look at seats that were, would just be a given that they would be um, a safe Republican seat, which could be, you know, could be thrown into a complete uh, toss-up situation depending on how things play out the coming year. Want to add anything to that, Catherine? I can't add anything on Republican voters in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm going to quickly just say thank you to everybody, and I believe Ed Whittingham, our executive director, is uh, online or on voice to just offer a couple of closing remarks as we wrap up. Oh, hey, Ed. Hi. Great. Thanks, Matt, and uh, thank you very much, Andrew, Greg, and Catherine. You know, I think this election result, it's part and parcel of the blowback that many parts of the Western world have experienced in 2016 in this march to greater tolerance, peace, and environmental sustainability. Um, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful for the hope that you've offered us. Uh, you know, you, you've given us lots to still, uh, for lots of reason to be optimistic. Uh, Andrew, uh, you talked and said that regulations that are in place take time to unravel. Uh, Trump doesn't have free reign, or to use your words, it won't be party time for the anti-climate portion of the Republican Party. And I would add that this particular president, I think, is going to get himself into trouble all over the place because of his leadership style, which will create distraction for him and for his administration. Uh, and the Republican Party, the majority of it, doesn't actually owe him a lot. So don't expect them to have his back at every turn. Uh, Greg, you pointed out that post-election, we've already seen a lot of backpedaling like Obamacare. Uh, he's proven himself to be malleable and his, shift, his perspectives uh, have shifted already. And you also encouragingly talked about how the clean energy transition is unstoppable for good economic and political reasons. And at Pemina, we certainly share that view. Uh, and so far, no country has threatened to pull out of the Paris Agreement. Uh, I would add to that the international community has figured out ways over the last two decades of dealing with issues when U.S. presidents have been outliers amongst world leaders, and I think it could use those ways again. Catherine, you, you focused more on 
what <laughs> impact this will have on Canada, uh, how it's going to create difficulty for the Trudeau government to carry forward on things like carbon pricing. Uh, hear you, we agree. Uh, but I really appreciate your rallying cry that we need to stay the course, we need to follow through on our promises, and frankly, that this is the moment for us to uh, have that candor and honesty that you talk, talked about uh, around key issues like which Canadian industries are truly vulnerable uh, if we have disproportionate climate policies uh, between the two borders. Um, and I would add that NGOs like Pemba, I think, have a very important role to play in injecting that candor and honesty into the debate. We plan on doing exactly that, and uh, it's incumbent on NGOs in general to hold governments to account, and uh, especially this new U.S. administration. So thank you again. Uh, I'd like to thank Matt, our other colleagues, my other colleagues who helped to make this webinar happy happen, and uh, the 236 of you who joined us today. So back to you, Matt. Okay, and we're a couple minutes over time, so I will call it there again. Thank Andrew, um, Craig, and Catherine for their participation today, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Fantastic. Great to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.